ladies and gentlemen of the law, service providers, youngers, judges, professors, and friends. We are grateful to the John Jay College of Criminal Justice for partnering. We welcome you all to our class closing. Today, I'd like to take the opportunity to answer three questions that pertain to honor violence and quickly discuss six cases of spousal honor killings in the Queen's County area. For that, we thank the Queen's DA office for giving us that information. The first question I would like to address is what are the unique circumstances facing women and girls in an honor-based culture. The second question is what are the challenges that face law enforcement professionals and service providers when confronted with these cases? My third question is are there crucial differences between honor violence and domestic violence as understood in America or in the West. Before I proceed, I would like to remark that in the Aha Foundation, we sometimes put an emphasis on Muslim women. By discussing the unique circumstances facing these women, I do not want to imply that this particular type of violence is limited to Muslim households or Islamic culture. There are non-Muslim cultures that engage in honor violence, that is punished behavior perceived to be shameful by females and sometimes male members of the family through beatings, coercion into marriage or murder. In these non-Muslim cultures, the individuals or groups who beat or kill justify their actions by drawing on religious scripture or on a long tradition of forefathers as role models. Today, there are examples of the Hindu and Sikh cultures in India and even incidents in Latin America. So, you may ask, then why limit our efforts to Muslim women? First, our expertise lies with this group and the unique circumstances that pertain to them. Second, the scale of honor violence against Muslim women is such that it is necessary to devote initial attention on this group. Muslim women, more than any other group, suffer honor violence in their countries of origin and within immigrant communities in the West. Third, our resources are limited. The broader a mission when resources are limited, the less effective an organization is or can be. Finally, with the resurgence of radical Islam, there is a resurgence of violence against women justified in the name of radical Islam. At the moment, we do not see this phenomenon in any other culture. However, we partner with women and other human rights activists that address violence against women justified in the name of any culture and religion. So to go back to the question, what are the unique circumstances facing these women? The first I'd like to draw your attention to is the code of honor and shame that governs a family, community, country, and even civilization. Acts of honor are rewarded generously. Acts perceived as shameful are severely punished, often with death. The second sentence relates to the first one and is unique to women in such a culture. It has to do with their sexuality. Virginity, chastity, 
fidelity and purity are emblems of honor. Sense before marriage, promiscuity, infidelity, and the reputation of being a loose woman are sources of enduring shame for the entire family or tribe. Women in these cultures not own their bodies. Their sexuality is a commodity of high value when tarnished and it is owned by male members of their families. It loses value when tainted with gossip or the possibility of gossip. It's considered perfectly normal for a father to select a husband of his choice for his daughter at any time of choosing. Refusal to comply with the father's choice of time and partner is an act that strips the father his work and thus his honor. If a woman or girl is sexually assaulted, then she is considered filthy, smeared, or damaged goods. Some families kill the victim, others opt her to an old poor or in some way disadvantaged male in the community and way the dowry. He does the family the faith hiding shame. The sexual assault can be a sort of strange or it can be incestuous. A father creates his job, she carries the shame. If a brother rapes his sister, she carries the shame. If an uncle rapes his niece, she carries the shame. She has to bear the consequences. Seeking a divorce by him is considered one of the worst insults to us. The only offense greater than that is committing adultery. In both cases, the offender has been to seek to regain his male authority or his honor by trying to kill his wife. Some husbands kept less on charges, for instance, of disobedience. We've also seen more trivial reasons for resorting to violence and even murder on the part of families, such as a female wearing makeup or staying up after dark, curfew hour or socializing with the other. The other can be the infant or the true, or it can be another tribe or another clan. Having a boyfriend, particularly if that boyfriend is not a Muslim. The third aspect that is need to honor and shame cultures, and particularly to Muslim is the great a great fear of reporting the violence or even talk about it to friends, teachers, mentors, and so forth. There are four common challenges I have had over the years from women position, in this position. One is the fear of losing the love and approval of one's family. The second Fear of bringing more shame upon the family by air death alone. The third is the fear of more physical punishment and even further family. And finally, there is the fear of enduring punishment in hell by our culture, our last commands, and the family. With this background, we come to the second question. What are the challenges facing law enforcement when confronting these cases? There are many, many challenges, and each case is unique. But I was able, again over the years, to distinct four. The first challenge that comes to us in Europe and the United States is ignorance. 
police and other service providers in the West are unfamiliar with the culture, the cultures of Nigeria, and the position of girls and women within these cultures. A notorious example is the story of Anas Mahmoud, who in 2005, December 2006, in the UK, sought help. She went to a police consul, Angela Thorne. Her father and her uncle tried to strangle but they wanted the murder to look like suicide, so they poured half a bottle of cognac down her throat. She was able to struggle free, break the window, get up, and run. And the first policeman she talked to, Okumen, refused to believe, said that she was a drunk, and afterwards charged her with breaking the window. Three weeks later, the nurse was by the father and the uncle. They are now in the old baby, but if that woman was not informed about this cult, she would not have tackled it and asked if she would be alive today. The second challenge to service providers and professionals of the loop are pressure groups. Pressure groups organized around their religion or around their culture. And they capitalize on the general ignorance. These pressure groups insist that there is no unique cultural circumstances, that mixed violence is a universal problem that represents all cultures and religions, and that any extra attention paid to the cultural aspects of our violence is a form of racism or Islam. These pressure groups publicly condemn the perpetrators while privately celebrating them and providing them with legal and financial assistance. The third challenge, that is the one, I have no better name for it, but to call it victim hesitance. While alive, before I'm killed, some victims feel lonely when they are rescued. They feel guilty and they breach the agreements with law enforcement. For instance, they tell members of their families where they are after they've been told not to. They agree to seek them at home. They are lured back into the family. They sometimes leave them the whereabouts of the shelters in which they are protected or in the foster homes. The fourth challenge that is only in relevant cases, the conflict of rights within the system. For instance, in my experience in the Netherlands, there was a policy of diversity that Turkish victims would attend to by church profession, Moroccan victims would attend to by government profession, etc. Now we had a case, a famous case, the one of cases, it was a notorious case, where a Turkish police kept revealing to the family of the victim where she was at shelter. Ultimately, this woman was found by her husband in a shelter and shot dead in front of it. It is a crisis like that that revealed that there is a conflict of loyalty. When it comes to professionals, of some ethnic groups and some religious groups between their workers' professionals and loyalty to their families altogether. The lesson that I have drawn out of many of these experiences is unless you are 100% certain, please do not involve professionals of the culture or the background or the religion of the victim in the process of helping them. By doing so, you create a huge risk of professional and the victim. You do not serve the victim's best interests. And victims are more inhibited around people who think condemn their behavior. Professionals need to come to loyalty to their community instead of to work. Because 
honor violence is often a sort of life and death. In this case, I charge you to err on the side. So that today, what are the differences between honor violence and the so-called Western justice? Domestic violence, it is true, occurs everywhere, across all places, tribes, cultures, religions, social classes, professionals, groups, and even age groups. Men are more likely to commit any violence, including domestic violence. Often, their victims are women and children. However, it's a myth to think that women do not engage in all manner of domestic violence. Women at home can be just as cruel as men, not more. In fact, it may be true that they may engage more verbal violence than men. The violence committed by men is more prominent because of extreme nature and the severe consequences of serious injury and death. That is the common picture. But in the text, people who commit domestic violence know they are doing something wrong and even criminal. The criminal justice system, all Western countries, recognizes domestic violence as a crime and as a pathology. In most Western countries, corporal punishment. Besides the law, in the West, there is an elaborate network fully provided special support by the government that offers services ranging from sheltering victims of domestic violence to providing counseling perpetrators. Usually, the abuser knows full well that when he hits his wife or his child, that he is doing something wrong. The child may not know any better, but certainly the wife knows that she should not be taken abuse. Clearly, it is an element of shame. The shame is on the victim's part for being too weak to call it help. Both the perpetrator's family and the victim's family, if they do find out about the abuse, condemn it and usually encourage the victim and support in gaining enough confidence to start out on her own again. Often, the perpetrator blames his violent behavior on substance abuse, such as alcohol drugs. Service providers explain that people who grow up without home neighbors, one parent, where abuse is tend to become abusers themselves. In any case, domestic violence, even though it occurs a lot in the West, is considered to be morally, legal, and socially wrong. Things are different in cultures governed by the code, honor, and shame. In these cultures, People who commit domestic violence are administering a physical punishment to correct a shame act committed by the victim. The perpetrator is something that is right. In most of the shame cultures, the criminal justice systems do not all recognize domestic violence as a crime. Unlike the West, there is no elaborate network of government help. In some countries, there are shelters set up for the help of Westerners. These are usually overcrowded and subject to all kinds of cultural constraints. Some countries, like Germany and Turkey, under pressure of Western local human rights activists, may take action against a man who commits an honor killing. But the prison sentences ridiculously 
as you are at six months. And even he can get away from this if he can prove, for instance, that the woman he stabbed committed adultery or the doctor he strangled had lost her virginity. The abuser and all these victims share a belief that the punishment is justified. The element of shame in this case is the action or inaction of the victim. Both this and our factors, if we do find out about the abuse, approve of it, and usually discourage the victim from provoking the abuser again. The perpetrator is seen as a problem for other men, a man who knows how to keep his heart under control. Often, the perpetrator has no history of substance abuse, such as alcohol and drugs. He may have no criminal record. The marriage of a wife or a daughter may be his past bad at home ever. Most people in honor and shame cultures grow up, violent homes, neighborhoods, and countries anyway, where all forms of power abuse are common. So this factor may be helpful as an explanation, but not helpful as a tool of prevention. In short, in honor and shame cultures, domestic violence as a tool of punishment for behavior perceived to taint the honor of the family is considered to be morally, legally, and socially right. Across America, almost every when the subject of violence comes up, most Americans say confidently, "It does not in America." Now, I'm going to share with you six six, six examples, uh, and this is the information that was provided to us. Things and it's things VA in Prince County. And this all happened about Queens. As the audience are invited to spot that the on none of these cases was considered to be an honor killing. But try and spot why you think that it might have been motivated by honor. The first is the case of Sharif Al Qaeda, a 24 year old Egyptian. On June 9, 1996, stabbed a strange law, man Ahmed more than 50 times during that argument. He fled to bleed. Al Qadi told this he and Ahmed began fighting because she had been out late and had not returned his confidence. He said the fight escalated when he accused her of behaving inappropriately as a Muslim woman. al Qaeda explained that he had seen her out as a nightclub and flirting with another man, and that he had found a love note in her purse. He then confessed to repeatedly stabbing Ima. al Qaeda was convicted of the jury trial of murder and was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. Then there is the case of Abraham Ani, 26 year old, another Egyptian national. In June 20, 1998, he stabbed his fiancée 15 times because she was disobedient and he was jealous of attention she received. Then she was a very active woman. He pleaded guilty to pass the manslaughter in for seven and was sentenced to. And a half to 25 years in prison. He argued that he was mentally unfit to proceedings that lasted nine years. And this is the case of Hamad Suleim, 49 years of Bangladeshi descent. This happened in December 22, 2007. He stabbed his wife 
251 times killing her. The murder occurred in front of the couple's four-year-old daughter. Suleiman claimed that his wife was physically ecstatic and said that she was not a single woman. Police officers called to the couple's home for a domestic disturbance or fight, but no arrests had been made. Suleiman pleaded guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to 50 years in life. Manslaughter. Muhammad Iqbal is the fourth case. 45-year-old Pakistani national. On April 13, 2020, Iqbal strangled his girlfriend, Khadija Mahal, to death with an extension and hid her body under his bed for more than 29 hours before dumping her at a Queen's Centre. The act occurred with an argument in which Mahal reportedly criticized her for being an employee. The case is pending and Iqbal is being charged second degree murder. The fifth case, an Indian national, and from his name I can gauge that he's not a Muslim. 40 year old Chachai Lisa Futama. On December 15, 1998, Chachai strangled his wife. He contested his mental fitness in proceedings that lasted nine years. In October 2007, Chakai pleaded guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to 15 years. The final case is that of Farid Popal, 36 year old Ghani national. In November of 1999, Popal killed his fiancee, Samia Kapi, by either striking or strangling, then burned and dismembered her body. Her body was never recovered. Popal's brother, Possibly helped to dispose of the body. He was also executed for his role. Papa was considerably older than Titi and had arranged the marriage through her parents. On the day of her disappearance, it is believed that Akiti intended to tell Papa that she did not wish to marry and that she had a boyfriend. Papa told a friend in Afghanistan she would be considered a poor for the way she lived. She would be killed and I would be considered a hero. Papal was convicted of murder in March 2006 and was sentenced to 26 years to life in prison. None of these cases was filed as an honor killing. If you Google on a killing, you will most likely find the definition used by Human Rights Watch. The definition goes as follows. Honor killings are acts of vengeance, usually by death, committed by many family members against female family members who are held to have brought this on from the family. A woman can be targeted by individuals within her family for a variety of reasons, including refusing to enter into an arranged marriage, being victim of sexual assault, seeking a divorce, even from an abusive husband, allegedly committing adultery. The mere perception that a woman has behaved in a way that dishonors her family is sufficient to trigger a child on life. Now, while this definition is true and patient good, it leaves out the fact that female members in an honor and shame culture engage actively in the persecution and eventual death. Before the thing, there is a long period, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, minutes, of honor violence that is beating this impression to persecutions post marriage. A victim can be pulled out of school, sent to relatives in another state or the country of origin of the parents. Death can occur as a result of a severe beating that was not intended to kill but to punish. Worst of all, as a result of the severity and duration of the abuse, what is happily counted as an honor killing was suicide. Lots and lots of women in these circumstances commit suicide. We at the AHA Foundation strive to, do it, to raise awareness, particularly in professionals' life, so that we recognize these agents before the life of a fellow human being is taken, so that you can intervene at the right time, and it's our duty to inform you. 
I have come to the end of my presentation, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions if the technology allows us. Thank you very much. All of these examples that you've given from Queens um, would seem to come from uh, places where there are large immigrant communities, or where the people who are involved are living with their with people within their uh, original cultures. And um, I'm wondering whether these types of things also happen in other parts of the United States where there are not these um, networks already in place for the, for the immigrants of the cultural community. The answer is we do not know yet. We, we have anecdotal evidence. Uh, anecdotal evidence such as I have given now in the examples from the DA's office or from newspaper clippings, from the media. Uh, but I can imagine, depending obviously on who the family is, um, if you come from a background where you attach a lot of importance to the sexuality of females, that it depends, regardless of however you know, remote a place you live in, that um, you will continue to carry on your tradition. So, Logically, I would think places with concentrations of ethnic groups or you know, religious minority, that that would be the place to look, but I wouldn't rule out places where one or two families, say from Afghanistan, if those two families attach a lot of honor, a lot of importance to honor and shame and the sexuality of females. We have a website, and immigrant communities are say the victims, potential victims, reach out to us at the moment. Uh, when I give speeches in colleges and across the country to different communities, um, sometimes girls come and tap me on the shoulder, pull me by the elbow and push a note in my hand. Sometimes they push notes into my hands when I'm signing books. And it's not only within America but also outside of America. Is there much assimilation, cultural assimilation, concerning this problem in the United States. My last example was a, a, a Somali cab driver in Kansas City who said he can't beat his wife anymore, whereas his friend beats his wife and it's wrong because he's told it's wrong. So now mind you, he's told it's wrong and he can get arrested, but the whole idea of cultural assimilation where this is, it becomes internalized that you just don't beat a woman or you don't kill them or whatever. Cultural assimilation in the US for, you know, regarding this group. Well, I see three types of cultural assimilation. One is the type of assimilation that we all want. That is people say from uh, cultures of honor and shame that are taking Western culture or American culture and just relinquishing, saying, you know, I don't care to control my daughter's movements, I don't care, a brother thinking I don't care about my sister's lifestyle. We see that kind of assimilation. We also see a second kind of assimilation, meaning a basic understanding of, say, the American legal system by the family of the perpetrators and them enforcing the culture of honor and shame at home and then shopping or say the most lenient forms of punishment. Uh, I remember in the Netherlands, when a family decides to kill a daughter, they would elect to have the youngest son do it because of the legal system in the Netherlands where minors get a very mild punishment. Something like, you know, two or three years in, 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 in a you know, youth prison, which is far less severe than a normal prison. Uh, and then the third is we see more and more young women taking on a Western lifestyle, enjoying their freedom, and that is a form of assimilation, and that's exactly what gets them into trouble with their families.